All right. Do you, I, I was saying, do you like my pun on the queens? Uh, it's it's four different artworks. Uh, when I was a kid, I collected stamps, and I had every penny, a British penny of uh, Queen Elizabeth, and then every Australian penny. They were like one pence, two pence, two and a half pence, and stuff like that. All these stamps. Uh, all right. So a little bit of um, history of artsy. Okay. Um, all right. So how many of you are familiar with artsy at all? A few hands, good. Uh, Artsy is, uh, Artsy's vision is that art can be as popular as music, and we do it by bringing the world of art online. So what does it mean? Uh, we, we were born as the Art Genome Project, and so that's a very interesting, almost academic project where art historians classify works of art by hand. So they get uh, works from museums, institutions, galleries, auction houses, etc. Look at them and say, okay, this is a contemporary work, maybe pop art, let's take a, a Warhol soup can, and it's, a pop, it's an iconic pop art work, so I'm going to assign it a value of 100 out of 100 in pop art. So pop art in this case is a gene. And then 100 is a value of the gene. Think of it as a feature. We call them genes. Um, and then you look at the Roy Wittgenstein work, and uh, maybe it's not as iconic pop art, and you'll say this is 75 out of 100 in pop art, and so on and so forth. So when I started about six and a half years ago, uh, we had maybe 100 genes. And then uh, right now, we have about 1,200. So this is an ongoing project, and our historians are spending all their time looking at the works and classifying them by hand. And now, once you have classified the works by hand, you can uh, build uh, all kinds of experiences on top of that. So the first one we've built is kind of a search engine experience. And uh, the way it works is actually very similar to what happens when you walk into a gallery and you see a curated show. Uh, typically, what would happen is that the curator started with a particular central work and then found similar works by other artists. And so the show now has a coherent story and many examples of different artists that represent that story. Very similarly, what you see on Artsy is a work, and then we show you similar works by other artists artists, and the data is done by art historians, so it's not your preference, it's the art historical data, and uh, the, the data is manual, and then the algorithms do the similarity matching. Uh, it's a typical nearest neighbor problem. It's very similar to, you know, more like this uh, that you see on many websites today. Um, so, the, the site launched in 2012, and um, today we can look back at this experience and really see Artsy uh, changing the way people collect and discover, people discover and collect art. So how do, what, what can you find on Artsy? Uh, you can find uh, over 4,000, these numbers are a little bit old, over 4,000 galleries. You can find uh, major institutions, thousands of artists, 700 museums or so, um, almost a million works today. We work with major auction houses and we do art fairs as well. So by all means, Artsy is the art world online, the fine art world online. So anybody who's in the business of fine art, uh, in the business of either showing works or selling works, you'll find them on Artsy today. Uh, so you can find Artsy on the internet on all kinds of experiences, on websites, apps, if you have an iPhone, download our app, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, what's particular about Artsy is that unlike many other art sites, we have uh, fine art world credibility. So you'll find on Artsy the largest galleries, the most famous and popular museums. Uh, you'll find all the biggest art fairs and so on and so forth. So including, you know, the Louvre, Gagosian Gallery, and etc. Um, and uh, on the other side of this, Artsy is a tech company, and we pride ourselves in uh, world-class uh, tech and design, and this is often recognized by others. So, for example, uh, the, the left image is actually uh, from the iPhone 6 launch, where they showed uh, Force Touch, and so imagine somebody on stage uh, showing Force Touch, and what they had on their phone is Artsy and they demoed that feature. That's an actual screenshot. There's another screenshot from the Apple Store uh, with Apple TV. We have an app as well. Um, so how do users uh, use Artsy? Uh, there, is, um, there are multiple ways to use Artsy. It depends uh, who you are. The majority of people uh, discover art through Artsy and read our publication and know about us as, uh, as a magazine or know about us as the largest database of contemporary art online. Um, 
there is the editorial platform uh, is uh, more conversational about art in general in the world, and so many many people read it today. And finally, a small portion of uh, of our audience actually collects art and uh, and buys uh, buys art via Artsy. And there's some anecdotes of how much you know inventory we have and so on and so forth. So by all means, we are a marketplace and a publication, and so. We make money in three different ways because we have to finance this whole our genome project story, and uh, we make money by listing galleries. So we have uh, we just raised a round of uh, a Series uh, D, and we announced 1,800 paying customers. So we have uh, almost 2,000 galleries that pay us uh, about six grand a year to be on Artsy. Uh, they do it because collectors find works on Artsy, then they inquire on the works, they connect to the gallery, so we act as a referral, and then uh, the gallery sells a work to the collector. We don't take commission, we only have a subscription service from that point of view. And then uh, on the other side, we work with commercial auction houses, you know, Sotheby's, Christie's, uh, Philips, and others. You could go today and bid on an auction on Artsy. Uh, you can bid live, uh, and you can bid on online-only auctions as well. Uh, for live auctions, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. We've only been in this business for a year and a half. Uh, the first year, we did maybe, I think, 20 auctions. The second uh, year, we are doing uh, over, this year, we're doing over 100. Next year, we'll do 400. And so this is growing really fast. And we are uh, kind of your agent. Think of telephone bidding, which I'm sure you've seen, where you call an auction house and there's a person bids, bidding on your behalf. We run the auction online, and then we have an agent that bids on behalf of all our users, so it's a lot more scalable. So in a way, we do the last, kind of phone companies do the last, don't do the last mile. Uh, similarly, we are the last 10 feet of your of your bidding inside an auction room. If you've never been at an auction, I strongly encourage you to go. All the Christie Sotheby's and other auctions are open to the public. You, most of the time, you don't even need to register unless they're selling, you know, hundred million dollar works, and it's really crowded. But go see, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars fly by. Uh, in an auction, uh, it's it, it's it's a fun experience. You can whenever somebody is visiting New York, uh, you know, bring them to one. It's a cool uh, spectacle. So uh, so we take commissions from those sales. So when you bid on Artsy and win, we'll take a small commission on those on on those works on those sales. Uh, and finally, Artsy is a publication, and we monetize it through brand partnerships. Uh, so uh, brands like UBS and, uh, and Gucci pay us to produce content about art. So we're not there to sell their wares and their handbags and other banking services. We're there to promote their brand associated with art content. They do it mostly because the same collectors that ha can afford really expensive works are also people who read about art and also want to see those brands associated with this kind of content. Um, so I'll show you some, um, some examples uh, and some numbers of our audience. And today we do something like 1.7 million uniques on our editorial. Uh, we do a bunch of events and so on. Uh, let me show you some examples uh, of what we do. So this is uh, behind the Biennale sponsored by UBS. This is actually old. We did another one. Biennale is every two years. It's in Venice. And uh, we did a 360 set, a, video, a set of videos that were 360 videos. It's a whole set of interviews and other things this year at the Biennale. And that's paid for by, by this brand. Uh, I'll show you a quick movie if this plays uh, of something that we produced. Here's Venice, home to the Venice Biennale, where every two years each nation on the map sends its finest artists to represent them on a world stage. Here it is in 1895, in 1972, in 2001. But what exactly are we looking at here? Or here? Or here? It's a visually demanding place. It's like an Olympic for art or something. With a 120-year history just as rich as that of the Olympics. A history that shows Venice's ability to mirror political and cultural attitudes of the times again and again. Which begs the question, what would the world be like without the Venice Biennale? Without the Biennale, Marinetti never would have dropped. Pablo never would have shot. He never would have showed Robert Popped, Marina never would have slapped. Major works by Kusama, Pollock, Clint, and Modigliani never would have been unveiled. San Marco would be empty, the galleries would be out of business, Venice would be a ghost town. Well, yeah, maybe not exactly. What did the world be without the Venice Biennial? We don't. 
you get you get the idea. So this is a this is a set of uh, this is a film that uh, is produced, and it's only the intro to many more. So if you go to Artsy and find the Venice Biennale from 2015, you'll find all these inter interesting uh, interviews and uh, stories about the art that was there. And you know, not everybody could have gone to Venice at that time, but you get to experience some of it. And now increasingly in you know VR and things like that. Um, so here's another example of the year in art from 2016, and then uh, an art market uh, series of videos, same, same idea. Nearly two million people attended art fairs last year, but the first ones were more like trade shows. Fast forward to the contemporary market and we get VIP rooms, private jets, champagne, and Sylvester Stallone. Fantastic, huh? And in the same way, costs for a gallery to attend have skyrocketed. Insurance, shipping, stalling, flights, hotels, entertainment. Watch part four of the art market on artsy.net. So that, another example of something that we produce. All right, so this is just like brand partnerships and media. This is the more visible part. And that's what a lot of people know us is from this kind of content, whether it's deep, interesting content about art or whether it's flashy videos uh, that introduce or explain the art market uh, to anybody who knows nothing about it. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about people at Artsim. Um, everything... Every question that uh, that starts with how do you do things, we always go back and uh, start it with people. So Artsy is a, is a particular kind of startup. We call it a value-based company. Uh, and uh, this is not something that was uh, created uh, by sprinkling it kind of all over our company and calling it a thing. Uh, we went on an offsite uh, when we were maybe 30 people and we sat down and we simply hashed out what was common between us and what were the values that defined us as a group and we came up with these. So this is very much a result of what the company was at that size and not something that was declared from the top or anything like that. So we, um, we ended up with the following. Uh, we, we call the first value that we have art and science. It's a little bit art and technology. So in a way, we always think about both the the artistic side of things and the scientific part of things. So we use our intuition, but we also like numbers and always the combination of those two. We value people first. So we make tons of decisions about what to do, uh, prioritizing people and uh, not prioritizing necessarily product or revenue. Uh, we are a very open company. You might know us for our open source. A very large part of our software is open source. That's just one example. We also tend to, uh, to create a different environment around the art. Art, is, art world, especially the fine art world, is very secretive. We've tried to do things in a very different way. Uh, we tend to not criticize things too much and try to have a very positive approach to how we do things. Uh, uh, always, always highlighting the better things and maybe not writing about the negative things. And finally, and this is one is my favorite, a lot of times people will say Artsy has amazing design and oh, your website is so beautiful. And actually don't remember a single time where we planned to have a beautiful website or great design. It came from a quality worthy of art. And so what that means is we, we looked at, uh, at works of art in major museums, imagine, you know, the Mona Lisa or anything that is, uh, that doesn't belong to us, that really belongs to humanity and belongs to, uh, to the world, belongs to our children, belongs to many generations of people. And, uh, we hang those works in these magnificent buildings. There's a reason why those buildings are built. It's because these works, they will transcend and pass on generation to generation. This is the most valuable thing in our world. And so what we try to do online is simply do a modest version of that. We wanted something that would be worthy of the art that we show. And, uh, and that's what came out as this beautiful clean design. A lot of the Questions like, should I have a big artsy logo in the middle or should I have the artwork in the middle were immediately answered by saying we want something worthy of the art. The only thing that matters is art and everything else can erase itself or become just a tool or being useful and nothing more. So we call it quality worthy of art and we, we try to uphold this value ever since. Uh, we are organized in very uh, interesting ways. Uh, Artsy is a complex business. We have a marketplace and we have this publication. So it's really hard to divide these things in certain uh, very straightforward ways. We don't have one unique revenue stream and one unique business. So we, we found uh, different ways to organize ourselves. So we call... Um, 
we, I'll start with product team. I'll start with businesses. So, and, and the floors in this, in this building are also divided mostly by businesses. So the first business, we call it listings uh, or galleries, fairs, and institutions. And that's the business that gets money from primarily galleries uh, for being on Artsy. The second business is auctions. Uh, auctions is where we get commission from our auction houses, our house partners uh, that are selling art through the Artsy platform. And finally, content, which is all the brand partnerships business. If you take listings and auctions together, uh, this can, you can see this as a marketplace. Uh, when those two connect, it becomes a full marketplace. Um, now, product itself, it's really hard to divide product in auctions and listings because con our customers, collectors, are not seeing this that way, right? You think about Artsy as one website or one application. So having auctions being very different from listings makes no sense. So we had to find ways to organize ourselves there. So we, we created these product groups. We call them partner success and revenue. So this is primarily, but not always, facing galleries. Auctions, which is very much a way of selling, kind of a vertical. Uh, collect experience, which cares about collectors. And publishing, which cares about editorial writers and so on and so forth. So if you think about these, they are much more role-based than, uh, than who we collect money from. And then finally, we have a ton of common practices that need to span the entire company. So an obvious example is design. While design is its own team, we try to embed a designer with every product team. While a product management is a function, we try to embed a product manager with every team. They might work for head of product. So all the things like design, finance, or marketing, these are practices. They are teams of their own, but they also practices that affect everything at the company. And we, in terms of engineering, we have something called platform engineering that serves other engineers, along with these product teams where most developers uh, spend, uh, spend their time. So that's a bit about how we organized. Um, a few notes on hiring. We, uh, we, we are pretty good at hiring. We like to do it a little bit differently from others. We don't torture developers on whiteboards, uh, despite the fun that it is to look at someone uh, be, be very, uh, very nervous and trying to write code on a whiteboard. Uh, so we tend to source uh, T-shaped people. This is, a, uh, this is a concept that was uh, coined by the founder of IDEO, uh, which is a very famous design firm. And a T-shaped person is somebody with broad set of interests and narrow specialty. So you'll find in our teams a lot of people who have had sometimes multiple careers or come from very unorthodox or strange backgrounds. You'll find MFAs on the engineering team and so on and so forth. So uh, we collected all kinds of misfits that other companies would not like because they are like very straight on the resume and want to have you know your Ivy League uh, type uh, grad that became worked for a large software company and then worked for another large company and then finally had enough money to work at a startup. So we have very very few people like that and we tend to source people from all kinds of horizons um, and then we call them T-shaped people, broad set of interests, narrow specialty. Um, the, our typical process is that uh, we start at the highest level possible. So I will take informationals or my leads uh, and directors will take informationals with any candidate first. Uh, Carter, our CEO, has, spends a tremendous amount of time with CRS hires first before they actually get interviewed. We determine whether they are uh, a fit at all, whether we think that you, will, you can succeed here. And then we actually do an interview, which is more like a broad experience interview. The question that we're always trying to answer in an interview is not, can you code this, but can you tell us what you've built and tell you can you tell us how? That's really important. Uh, we, this is the 50% of the interview process. We tend to do uh, extensive references. So we will ask uh, our candidates for, to provide references and we will uh, almost have an argument with the reference about whether this candidate is amazing or not amazing. What we want to hear is very consistent stories about how uh, you or this, this candidate was really, really strong in the team that they were in. Uh, we use a uh, comp framework, so we don't. Uh, we have a very clear idea of what every individual at every level in the company uh, costs. You know, we look at the market and we spend a lot of time analyzing what market pays. So we make uh, 
we, we make offers, you know, regardless of who you are, where you come from, and the, it's the, the market that determines uh, what that offer is. And then we make offers and usually uh, people want to work here after a great experience. And so we have a very high acceptance rate. Uh, so that's our interview process. I can answer questions about all these things later if you want. Uh, a tiny bit about engineering. Everybody writes code here? Yes, great. Okay. Um, it's huge. Artsy is a huge engineering challenge. Uh, we need a Trello board to even know who owns what project. We have literally hundreds of GitHub repos, uh, services, applications, and so on. But Artsy originally started as a monolithic Rails app, and then we detangled it into many services and many other things. That's kind of an old breakdown of our uh, languages. So a lot of stuff is written in Ruby. A bunch of JavaScript more and more these days, some Objective C, Swift, and we have some Scala services uh, recently. Uh, we use uh, all kinds of backends. Uh, we, we started on MongoDB. We have a lot more Postgres uh, today. Uh, we like systems like Elasticsearch uh, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. That's actually a good, a good uh, lesson. We started building search ourselves for the R genome similarity search. And uh, after two or three years of working on it and actually succeeding at launching the site on it and et cetera, we slowly removed that code. And today we use almost all Elasticsearch out of the box because that technology has matured. We do a lot of data processing and machine learning and things like that in Spark. And we throw all the data in Redshift uh, that's our typical data pipeline. Again, can answer lots of questions. Most of our front ends are open source. You can see our website, our uh, mobile app on GitHub. It's called Eigen. It's very popular as, a, as an example of a complex uh, iPhone app. Uh, Force, which is our front end uh, website, went through many iterations. First, it had two parts, which was, uh, which was a main site that had a mobile arm that was very different. Now we've merged them because Google wants us to be responsive and so on and so forth. Our management applications are typically um, done in Rails. So we try to make it very generic, very vanilla, playing lots of, lots of boring Rails apps, as we would call. So all our cool stuff is user facing. All our boring stuff is customer facing. Um, we run on AWS. We typically start our applications on Heroku, and then they mature slowly into uh, something that might require some vertical scaling, and we'll throw them on AWS. We used to use Opsworks. We do increasingly Docker and Kubernetes for, uh, for these things. Our teams do DevOps, so there's no operations team. There's no QA team. Uh, you own your services from the beginning until the end, and you operate them. And of course, we tend to share common practices using our platform team. Um, finally, most importantly, we are open source by default. Uh, that does not mean that all our software is open source. However, it means that by default, everything that we start is open source unless we think that there is a real advantage not to. So most companies think of this as first I build something proprietary and then I see if I have any advantage to open sourcing it. We do the opposite. We start open source and then we keep something closed when it's a secret and you will not tell you about any secrets so it will just look like we're fully open. So. <laughs> Uh, that's all I have for you. Brief overview, and I, I'll take any questions you want about any of these topics. Uh, you can email me if you want to do it offline, Twitter, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? I'll take a question or two. Hey, thank you so much. The presentation was really awesome and super informative in terms of like engineering perspective. Uh, question is about Android. Seems like you don't really do anything connected with Android. There is no Java that you're using, unless there is probably an Android application that you wrote in Scala, which I don't really think is happening. Thank you. No, we do not have an Android app. And it's been a, a debate in the company for the last, I don't know, four or five years or six years, probably. Uh, we've been wanting to release an Android app, then uh, product priorities. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, I think uh, a lot of it was the audience that we're trying to reach is, uh, is, is a, was a very high-end audience. Uh, today, we reach a lot of uh, not high-end audience with editorial, and uh, that kind of doesn't require the app as much. Uh, our mobile experience is actually primarily geared to buying art. That's what the iPhone app does today, mostly. And then everything else is available without the app, and of course, through the app if you have it. So uh, when 
just for the anecdote, in the early days of Artsy, I would go to an art show. We, we did this like charging station. And uh, uh, during the first days, which is like the VIP preview, literally not a single person asked for an Android charger. And I think this has changed quite a bit. And Artsy is long overdue to release an Android app. So thank you for the question. Mike. I'll repeat the question. Okay. Yep. Uh, uh, so I was just wondering more about the uh, genome project, specifically, um, since considering genres to be kind of like grouping or like art or technologies, uh, how do you work with like the art historians and like making your database kind of flexible? And are there any challenges that you get when you work with uh, historians? Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we work with art historians? Uh, how are we flexible? And what are the challenges working with art historians? Um, I think working with art historians is kind of the opposite of challenging because every time you talk to them, they're fascinating people and I learn so much. So I don't feel like working with them is necessarily a challenge. Now on the art genome project itself, uh, there is a lot of challenges. Think of it as a, uh, a chemical, uh, what is it called, the Mendeleev um, element, uh, the, the table of elements, right? And, the periodic table of elements, thank you. Uh, it's basically, that's what the genome is, and there's 1,200 boxes for every single work. So imagine you have millions of works, 1,200 boxes, and you have to fill numbers. So this is a huge data challenge in terms of user experience, and also at the end, what you do with the data. Uh, we've devised some really clever ways uh, to, uh, to, to navigate this. A lot is keyboard-based. Uh, Roop, who is sitting in, in the back, has worked on some of this stuff, and uh, you can ask him a lot of the specific questions. Uh, that project was called Helix, and uh, there, there's many others where we, uh, we try to really create a a user-friendly way of editing the, the genome. Um, then other than that, it's really a dictionary, uh, a feature set of, of, of numbers. So, uh, and then it constantly changes their new genes created all the time. Uh, there was a question here. Yeah. Uh, you guys have been partnering with auction houses and the way the, the online auction has been going, do you see that in the future, online auction will replace the actual Brick and mortar of, uh, house. Uh, so we work with auction houses. The question is, will online auction house replace the brick and mortar auction house? Uh, this is a common question in the art world of, will the online experience replace the in-person experience about art? Uh, I sat in museum meetings years ago where the museum directors would say, we will never put the art online because it will, it will, what it will do is it will take away from the actual live experience of visiting the museum. I think by now everybody has convinced themselves that the opposite is actually happening. And the more you put online, the more people want to go and see the real thing. So I think if, if I want to see the real work, I will, go, I will go see it if I can, if I can afford it, if I can be in the same city, if I can actually go there. If I know what I'm buying and it comes from a reputable source, then uh, I already am not in the auction house today because you know, I call up my agent and they buy it for me. Uh, or, I, or I just bid online, this technology has existed for quite a while. Uh, same thing with galleries. People don't buy art really like on a add to cart checkout. That's not common. Uh, and most people want to experience the work on the wall or standing as a sculpture. And uh, engagement is not something that, uh, that can be replaced by online in any way. However, as I was saying, the, the way people discover art has really changed. And I think the first interaction with art is increasingly on the internet. Whether it's on Instagram because somebody took a picture, whether it's on Artsy because you were mindlessly browsing through the Art Genome Project, or whether it's from editorial because you read about some artist that speaks to you in their history and their process, and not necessarily in the work that they produce. And so discovery is now increasingly online and the actual experience I think is only gaining from it. And there's more people going to see art today than ever before. And I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah. Thank you, Vivi. Um, my question is always, a, sorry, thank you. My question is always about blockchain. So that seeing the introduction of blockchain being the future to assist um, the art world. And there was a meetup that I missed last week about it. But so I kind of want to know how you, um, you think blockchain technology will help advance the art world, if you, if you think it will. And also, another question is, do you sell, sorry, do you also provide peripherals 
um, like you talk about the art and the auction, but then I think about peripherals like framing, insurance, you know, handling, yeah, those services. Do you also do that? And if not, are you planning to do that? Like, um, I'll answer the second question because it's easier. We uh, we certainly continue to be the platform for the f for the art world. We don't want to be any of the existing participants, so we're not trying to replace any of the current players. We're not an auction house. We're not a gallery. We're not an insurance company. We're not uh, anything that already is there. We are a new thing. We are the aggregate of all these. We are the marketplace online, and so uh, our goal is to bring everybody through our platform and make it much more efficient, make it cheaper and stuff like that. So we won't be a framer and we won't be an insurance company, but most definitely will provide services through insurance companies and framers so that you as a consumer can have a choice about what, what you're using there. And I totally realize that with this kind of power comes a lot of responsibility. We see this happening again and again in other in other places like the Amazons of the world. So they're very careful to construct something that will be a win-win situation for everybody and not just for us. Um, the second question around blockchain, I gave a talk on art world and blockchain. You can find it on, uh, on, on my personal blog. Uh, there's, like a, there's a video recording and so on. You can find it there. And um, I, think, I think we... We re it's really a big question about the future. I'm very bullish on blockchain and Bitcoin. I think that uh, in the future, more things will be decentralized. And as far as, uh, as far as if you look at Artsy, which is a centralized platform in some ways, uh, the question is like, what kind of value do we provide in a completely decentralized world? And I think it fits really, really well. Artsy's first mission is to help you discover the art. And no matter how decentralized the world is, you'll still need central places to actually have a great discovery experience, access it, make it available in one place. And I don't know where the data will be stored and how it will be distributed, but I certainly see that as, a, as something that will continue existing. And then in general, if you look at the company like Artsy, which has a ton of data on like primary market of sales, secondary market of sales, uh, we really need to find value of using that data and create tools and services that are, uh, that are much more intelligent and, and that we're not uh, using that as just the uh, they afforded the data, I have this information, and now I can manipulate the market because I have the information. That's like the opposite of what I would ever want to do. Uh, I want to create values such as giving you more, uh, more information about pricing and more access to, uh, to tools that help you make a good decision about what, say, an artwork is worth if you are going to buy it. So an, an, an example of something like that, now not related to blockchain, is that we've shown to our gallery partners that... Uh, let listing prices, which seems like an obvious choice for anybody who sells anything on the internet or not on the internet, is actually a good thing. But galleries are notoriously secretive about prices. And depending on who you are, the price is completely different. So walk into a gallery, ask for a price, walk back the next day, ask for a price again, and you'll find like two completely different numbers. And half of the time, the work is not even on sale because you know, they don't know who you are. So this is all changing very, very quickly. And, uh, and it's more like common commerce uh, where information uh, actually creates more value. And so we think the, uh, the art market will go that way and information will become publicly available. Uh, identity will be owned by us, by you, by me, by you, and not by like centralized authorities. Uh, and all that can be enabled in blockchain. So I'm, I'm very excited about that future. Whether we have any blockchain products today, we do not. Of course, in the future in the future we're going to have everything. <laughs> One more question, and uh, there's lots of people. There was a question in the back before, so I'll take that. And yeah, so, so, what are the obstacles in scaling the business, and what are the opportunities in scaling the business? I'd say the number one uh, problem. So external problems, convincing people that the internet is a real thing. That was, you know, it's here to stay. That was really hard. Uh, I am not kidding. This is, uh, this is, this is real. Uh, the, uh, the second thing, I, I think, you know, my dad, I don't think still believes that it's, it's real. Uh, this, I think it's a little bit generational and a little bit of like, the art world is fine the way it is. Uh, internally, the hardest thing is not doing too many things 
at once. We do a lot of stuff and a little bit of it. And so we struggle to advance some of these things big time. So scale is difficult in a very complex business and the fact that we're just doing everything at once. Um, and then the future opportunities, I think technology can, uh, can replace all the inefficiencies, that's pretty obvious. And uh, we can define how we want the art world to be, I think, in the future. And that's the biggest opportunity for us, is to, to uh, both benefit from and also create, in a way, the, the, the future of culture, the future of fine art. I'm certainly excited about the future where art is the most important thing. I think once the machines have replaced all of us, uh, and I don't mean like all of us, code will still be writing code probably for a little longer but everything else will get replaced by machines and the question is what are we going to do and so i hope that the answer to that will be more time money spent on education on art and things that really matter for for humanity on that note uh all right everybody um that was db our cto let's give him a second round of applause <laughs> Um, all right, we're going to give it a 10 minute ish gap, gives you a chance to get up your seat and move around a little bit. Um, and then we're going to come back with a panel with, um, me, DB, Kana, Christina and Craig. Um, and we'll introduce ourselves properly then. So see you guys all in 10 minutes. All right. Can everyone have a seat, please? Awesome. Let's give DB another round of applause for that awesome presentation. All right. So um, what we have here today is we have a couple of artsy engineers who are going to answer a couple questions and then we'll open up for you guys to answer questions. Um, for those of you who didn't see me during the launch, I'm Ariel. I'm the head of student success at C4Q. Um, and then we're going to go down the line and have each of these engineers introduce themselves. So the first thing you're going to answer is your name, your role, how long you've been an engineer, and then how long you've been at Artsy. Hi, everyone. Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> My name is Kana. Um, I'm an engineer lead here at Artsy on the publishing team. Um, I've been here for a little over two and a half years. Um, was there another question? How long Oh, and I've been an engineer for two and a half years. <laughs> Hi, my name is Christina, um, and I'm an engineer here on the Collector Experience team. And what were the other questions? How long have I been here? Yeah. Um, so this summer made two years, and how long have I been an engineer before that? Maybe add about eight months, so you do the math. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Craig Spaeth. I'm the director of product engineering here. Um, I've been an engineer at Artsy for just over seven years, and I've been programming for uh, up about 12 years, but I don't know if I would consider that being an engineer every year, <laughs> but maybe at some point I cross from like coder to engineer. Uh, I'm DB, chief tallest officer at Artsy. Uh, I wrote my first program, in, I think, in '92. So, so that's 26 years. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. How long have you been at Artsy? Oh, I've been at Artsy for six and a half. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Otto the Rocks. Um, I'm an engineer at Artsy. I'm not strictly on a single team, and I managed to wipe the rest of my uh, like title bio off recently. Um, and I've been here for six years. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So um, this is your first site visit of the year. Thank you guys for doing the inaugural visit for these guys. Um, and a lot of them, all of them, will be entering the software engineering field soon. Um, and they're really curious to find out what it's going to be like to have that first job. So the first question is, how did you get your first job? Um, oh, I've got the mic, so I'll take it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first engineering job was, uh, OK, tiny bit of back. Wait, I think I actually told you first engineering job when I came to do your like commit yeah you don't need to know that yeah no we'll, we'll move that on I don't know what your first engineering job was uh, all right TLDR um, back in the olden days uh, the uh, of Mac development there was only one website you could go at to actually apply to be a Mac engineer anywhere and um, so I applied on that 
and managed to get a job working in Brazil uh, making Ruby Mac apps. So I got to do a bit of Ruby, which I was interested in, and a bit of Mac, which I knew of, and found out that when you combine the two, they just crash a lot. <laughs> um, the first time I got paid for software was uh, to, uh, I, I, I wrote a calculator and sold it as shareware in the late 90s. It was called Expression Calculator, and some German company wanted to press it on CDs and sell it in the store was called Global Calculator, and they did 3,000 copies. Yeah. Uh, it was written in uh, Delphi, uh, Object Pascal for Windows. And then the first job where I got paid to write software was uh, I pitched a uh, document management thing to some company, and they said, why don't you write it for us? Because uh, it sounds like a good idea, and it was the worst experience ever because they paid me very little money, and I worked like crazy writing this massive document management system um, that was my first job <laughs> ironically the first time I got paid for programming was also my own thing in Delphi Pascal where I wrote scripts that automated if anyone's familiar with World of Warcraft or uh, massive multiplayer online games I wrote bots that would mine for you and play the game and then I built a website to sell the bots and sell the gold and then I made, I learned to make websites and I did a lot of freelance my own stuff and then my first real, I'd say, career job would be actually artsy, uh, the, behind all that freelance and self-venture stuff. And yeah, I joined as the first product engineer person here, so it's been quite a ride. So my first, um, I guess, real engineering role, um, I went to a boot camp similar to you guys. I did a boot camp in, called Ada Developers Academy and it's in Seattle, Washington. And the way that program was set up was six months in a classroom learning to program and then six months in an internship. So fortunately, I got hired by my interning company. So, yep. Awesome. Um, so my first engineering job was um, is artsy. Um, and I also went to a boot camp. So I went to the Flatiron School, which is in Manhattan. Um, and I really, really wanted to work at artsy. Um, and they have like an open API or we have an open API that you can use and make stuff with it. So I made a like game. Um, if you guys are familiar with like the Wikipedia game where you like try, to, you start at one link and then you try to get to another. So I did that, but with Artsy's API um, and I built a game where you try to get from like one artist or artwork to like another artist or artwork just through its links. Awesome, thanks guys. So to take these developers a little bit deeper into your first jobs, what was that first day like? Tell us what that was like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the first day, um, I think it was a lot of, well, it was for sure a lot of like company onboarding stuff. So there was like a pretty um, like structured kind of way we would come in. I, would, I came in and, you know, learned about the company and all of like the HR stuff. Coding wise, um, I remember deploying to production on the second day um, of engineering uh, with actually Craig who helped me deploy something. So that was really exciting. Um, definitely like kind of just dive, dived right in. So since I had already been interning at the company that I got hired in, it was pretty seamless. It was just like another day. Um, <laughs> but I think my first day at Art2 was much more interesting. Um, I think generally we try to get people to ship on the first day. There is lots of onboarding, but usually it's like a bug fix or a small, tiny feature. So yeah, that was fun. Uh, like I said, I was the first product engineering hire here. So <laughs> it's going to be quite a different story. Um, Let's see. So I was I had a title of product manager, which is ironic because there was no product or people to manage in product at the time. Uh, but I did manage some outsourced rotating cast developers, primarily in Ukraine. And I spent my first day was chaotic. And I had just flown from Ohio into New York and had my bags with me. And Carter, our CEO, was taking us to the Apple store to get my computer to set up my <laughs> environment. It took me like a week to dig through a completely undocumented code base. And I could go on and on, but it, it was uh, it was chaos. But it was it was great, and I was uh, like thrown into the deep end. I learned a lot of stuff on my own. Had to kind of Google around and get my my own setup going, and realized that I was going to be doing a lot of the prototypes until luckily DB came around, uh, and a couple of months later after that, and we 
actually got our first round of funding, and the rest is history, so I'll start passing this on to DB now. <laughs> um, I don't think my first day at Arts is particularly interesting, although my, uh, my fourth day at Artsy was interesting, but I, I, I've been helping Artsy a little bit on and off and got sucked in into the job, but my, my first official uh, day at Artsy was, I think, on March 2nd, uh, and on March 4th, my second kid was born. Wow. So I was, uh, had like two <laughs> children at the same time. In some <laughs> way. Amazing. Um, I don't think my, f uh, so it, it was in Brazil, right? So actually my first day was spent trying to learn Portuguese and, uh, <laughs> and uh, trying to make sure that like all the code base wasn't actually also in Portuguese, uh, which was kind of uh, a stressful first day. But I got some code wrote, I think. Uh, we also got stoned throughout most of the day, so <laughs> it, was, uh, <laughs> it was a pretty, pretty, pretty interesting work experience. <laughs> <laughs> Just telling you how it is. <laughs> I don't have anything more to add. <laughs> the rest of Silicon Valley episode four. <laughs> Thanks, Orta. Um, so I hear a lot about hitting the ground running. I hear onboarding. I hear a few things about training and maybe one other random thing that Orta just shared, culture. Um, what would you guys say is the most important thing that you learned on your first job? I'll, I'll, I'll answer since I have the mic. The thing I think that, uh, uh, that you want on your first job is to, to accomplish something. Uh, wh whatever it is, like one thing that you actually take to completion, no matter what, which one it is. Like I like, like a, a little bit of code committed uh, in anywhere, end-to-end. Uh, -end. If you can get to deploy it, that's even more amazing. But that's, that's really what you want to have done. Um, so for me, like coming out of a boot camp, I think one of the most important things I learned was that, that there's a huge difference between writing the code that you like first learn between writing production code. So I think that was pretty like learned that process of like, what does production code look like was pretty important. And then I would say that the second one, um, like for me, I feel like the value of boot camps is yeah, you learn to code, but more than that, I think you learn how you learn. Um, so you learn how to deal with that, that uncomfortable phase of, of not knowing something and, and, and being unfamiliar with it. So I think on the first job that kind of gets reinforced like it, you figure out that oh this is going to be my life for the rest of the career like i'm just going to have to continue to learn and be uncomfortable and vulnerable and that's okay um for me one of the biggest lessons was to very early on try and find um somebody like you know you're thrown into maybe hopefully a large-ish engineering team that um you're going to borrow a lot of ideas and a lot of um pretty much like mentorship from um, your peers and really like finding people that you're comfortable with um, and then getting to know them on like a personal level and, you know, helping them out and having them help you out. Um, finding those kinds of relationships, I think was really important early on. To piggyback off that, Kana, can you talk about the process that you went through to find your mentor or whether or not your first job actually had a formal mentorship process? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, Artsy has a uh, I forgot what they're called, it's like uh, go spirit, guide. spirit, spirit guide. yeah, spirit guide. <laughs> and they are a, a mentor, but outside of like your immediate team. So they would be, uh, actually, I didn't have a mentor when I first came on board, but uh, ideally that person would be like somewhere in finance or the arts teams or whatever. Um, and they would help you guide you, help guide you through like more of the kind of like social company wide stuff and questions you might have. Um, but then for like, I guess if you join a company that doesn't have like a structured mentor system, um, which I think for me when I started, there wasn't uh, necessarily anything like that for artsy engineering. Um, it ended up kind of, I kind of just ended up like asking Craig a lot of questions. Um, and yeah, because he was my immediate boss too, and he still is. But um, uh, yeah, getting comfortable with with um, your boss or anybody who you feel like is um, that you can talk to. So I think um, 
while we didn't really have a formal mentorship, I guess, structure set up, mentorship was something that was really important to me. So like, it's kind of like one of the things that I, I guess I would say I negotiated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so when I started, I, I definitely did have a dedicated technical mentor. And that was the, the person that I would direct my questions to. And kind of the person that I felt like kind of partnered with me in, in my growth and, and evolution as an, a junior engineer starting in artsy. If I, if I may add, uh, I think, I, I think we, we do okay with mentorship. We do try to assign mentors now and uh, make it very explicit. But it's a great question to ask a company before you join of whether something like that is going to happen or you'll be thrown into the pond and learn to swim by swimming. <laughs> Sorry. At RT2, there's a lot of informal um, mentorship that, that goes on and, and, that ranges from someone who's maybe not as experienced, but like good at a particular thing to someone who's very much more technically experienced that, that shares their knowledge. So that, I feel like we do that almost kind of seamlessly. Um, still on the topic of the first job, when did you guys start to actually feel like you were contributing? And then what do you say to someone who doesn't feel like they're contributing when they first start on the job? <laughs> I don't think I'm contributing. <laughs> Um, sometimes, sometimes that opinion is just outright wrong. Um, I, I've hired juniors and uh, we were both working on the same project and by having a junior on the project it meant they could actually kind of sweep up all the small problems away so that somebody who uh, is more senior can actually work on much harder bigger problems. So even if you really are just doing lots of small things in order to uh, like you know both level up yourself and to make features on a product by enabling somebody else to be able to spend time concentrating on larger issues, you're also contributing. It's not always strictly about your direct contributions to a project. It can also be about enabling your team to be able to like pull off harder ideas. Yeah, the, the, that said, contributing to a code base in any meaningful way, even if it's a typo, is valuable. And uh, I encourage you to find lots of typos in Orto's code uh, and go and PR that. And he has... He, he has a lot of typos. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just going to add on to what Orts was saying that I think it's, I've always tried to m emphasize getting a, a deployed to production when onboarding uh, new members and trying to find something that's as simple and small as like a CSS change or like the most minimal amount of code just to get someone going through the the flow of things and being able to actually get something in production and get that win as soon as possible and then finding that all the opportunities continue leveling up. Um, I think it's at some point when you keep leveling up the task and making it more difficult, you find sort of the opportunity where, okay, now I've contributed lots of different things. What is something that somebody who's on that trajectory, what can they do to just really take over and give away an entire ownership? I guess this is like speaking from a different uh, angle of kind of onboarding various engineers at Artsy, but I've always hope to try to find opportunities to actually give away chunks, give away your, as DB likes to say, giving away your Legos and being able to give somebody something that's even bigger and they can actually start to take on wear more hats and be like the full owner and point person for a project that you might have formerly been uh, holding or guarding to, to yourself, I think is really helpful to get engineers kind of getting that next level. But one thing I was going to mention is that, like, especially, I think, starting out and being junior, there's, there's a difference between, like, feeling like you're contributing and then actually making, a, a, you know, contributions. And like Orta said, more often than not, you're probably actually making con contributions. You just feel like you aren't because you're, you're, you're still at that point where you're learning a lot. Everything's really new. Um, and I would say in my case that I feel like my peers dropped the junior long before I had. So maybe my, my peers probably dropped it maybe at a year and a half and it, I feel like I'm just now dropping it, but it's relative. So I feel like if you're, if you're still there, you're probably contributing. <laughs> yeah, I don't have too much to add to that. I mean, I still consider myself a junior in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, I'm always getting help from, from my peers. Um, one thing we do on our, we have like a Monday engineering wide meeting. Um, we're, there's one part of it where we give like props to each other. So I think like that kind of format where, you know, somebody might have made a small contribution and 
you know, they might not feel like it's uh, super impactful, but kind of bringing it, bringing it up in environments uh, in the larger engineering team and giving props and everybody snaps and it feels good and um, kind of like making those acknowledgements uh, to the wider team is um, sometimes encouraging for those starting out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to ask a few more questions and then I'll open up to let you guys ask because I'm sure you have many questions on your mind. Um, I'm curious from you guys, what has been like the most surprising thing that you faced as a professional uh, software developer? Is there something that, like a misconception that you realized or something that you didn't expect that you experienced? Somebody want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm always very surprised by uh, how I'm so convinced that something is right, <laughs> and then two years later, I'm so convinced that it was totally wrong. <laughs> and uh, and also, and I think a lot of it is because technology changes. And so sometimes the right answer now is really the wrong answer later. And so uh, you make a choice that's very deliberate. You're going to have to live with a choice for a very long time. But somebody, something will come up that will completely change the equation. And, uh, and so whatever you thought was true is just no longer true anymore. So uh, you know, I'm surprised by how little I know about technology today uh, because it's, complete, it's a totally new world from you know, five years ago. I think the uh, biggest general surprise for me is how much of your life, uh, once you start programming in a team, is more about the social aspects of programming. A lot of it's about uh, communication with other people. And so, you know, I, I spend a good t amount of time programming, but I also spend a very large amount of time documenting my programming. In an ideal world, you want to be leading other people to be able to do the same kind of projects as you as to make yourself as, uh, as ununique as possible for somebody else to replace you and take over your role and for you to either grow and, into a new person or to try a new thing. Um, and so communication and caring about communication is just something that I just had to learn. And uh, it's a little bit harder than code sometimes. <laughs> so... Um, I would say I've been pretty surprised at um, how the, the process one uses to engineer a thing can pretty much be applied to almost everything. Um, I feel like like learning to code or going through a boot camp has been like alternative business school. I feel like med school like diagnosed it myself like hmm. <laughs> so I would say definitely just like um, it's really valuable just to apply to life like programming is life. Just to piggyback on what um, what Orto is saying. Um, wait, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, else want to go? <laughs> I'm starting to lose my train of thought here. Um, yeah, I was going to kind of uh, piggyback off what Orto and DB were saying that I think it's, I guess, like, surprising and sort of the entire like 12 years of programming and kind of reflecting on it that some of the, the hardest challenges and most common challenges in programming are not often the like deep technical challenges and there there's a lot to building production ready software and a lot of what is important is building software that's easy to collaborate on and easy to use and easy to understand and very rarely do you encounter the really deep like algorithmic heavy uh, technical challenge that said they all those things crop up so there's but they're a lot more rare than what you end up uh, the, doing on more of a day-to-day -day, which is like building especially at a company like artsy where we're building software that's meant to last for a long time a lot of the bigger challenges is how do you build software that many people can cont contribute to many people can own and maintain and really more like human challenges than necessarily technical challenges I, I, I think on the tail end of that, I'm surprised anything works, knowing like <laughs> how the software is built and how messy and complicated it is. Um, so I remember like one fun thing that you should, you guys should totally do is like after the, the first like month or so of engineering work that you're doing, um, like kind of go back to the first things that you PR'd and that you submitted and look 
look at how terrible that code is <laughs> and then just like make it better because I think that's like a huge learning thing too and even like I'll look back on stuff that I wrote when I first started and just be like I'm just shocked that somebody was would accept that PR <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah that's all part of the learning process <laughs> awesome so I'm gonna ask one final pretty personal question and I want you guys to be honest three-part question so what's been the biggest challenge or failure that you guys have faced as software engineers what is something that you're the most proud of and then what is some advice that you have for our developers here so I choose one of those so. all three <laughs> And you have the mics. <laughs> so I could say the most proudest thing that I've done. Uh, let's see. I think it was definitely um, growing my team. So now I just have one other engineer that is working on my team. But it was uh, kind of a huge deal to me for being an engineer for just two and a half years and uh, getting that opportunity to lead a team. And I'm still learning. I still consider myself a junior. Um, but somehow people are letting me do this. So um, it's a huge learning experience. And I think mentoring, uh, you know, once you guys get to be uh, full-time engineers, you'll end up mentoring other people too. And I think that giving back part is, is really um, exciting. <laughs> yeah, let's see. yeah, I had to think a little. <laughs> we, can, we can come back to that. <laughs> okay. Does anyone know? What was your first question? Um, failure. Yeah. Failure, oh, something you're proud yeah. of, and then advice. I did say the proud of one first. You said proud of. We could do proud of. Okay. Um, I would say one, one of the things I'm proud of would probably be um, contributing to open source, because like, like maybe a year ago, that is something I totally wouldn't have had the guts or courage to do. Um, and then second, um, writing a blog post about my experience at Artsy. Um, again, just kind of being in the front and, and yeah, that's not my thing. So just sharing my experience and being really vulnerable um, was made me pretty proud. Christina, well, open sources, we you in the One has been Babel early this year, um, and then Rake Ruby, um, and a few small changes to um, Ruby as well. <laughs> little, probably a million stars or something, GitHub stars in total there. Just some small little projects you never heard of. Um, yeah, I, I guess not, I mean, I, very much what Kana said, my proudest uh, moments in my programming career is being able to, I mean, I, like I said, I joined Artsy as the first product engineering person. I've grown with this company. I've been involved in growing this amazing team with incredible engineers that I'm sitting here with today and being able to see uh, Kana being able to take on such amazing, incredible amounts of engineering challenges and growing a team herself and Christina contributing huge open source projects and working with brilliant engineers I'm standing with here. It's, it's been definitely my proudest achievement has been just the team that I've been able to uh, help build and see the accomplish, amazing accomplishments they've made. It's hard to, to be proud of many other things when you sit with four other engineers who actually don't have a technical background, uh, did not go to do computer science in college. I'm the only one on this panel, I think, that did, the candidate as well. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the, these people, when they were in school probably didn't think that they would be engineers much less contributing to rake uh, so i'm very very proud of what they have accomplished and uh, proud of you know, of it being able to enable something like this at scale at a company that's doing extremely well and uh, you know I'm, I'm proud of all of you have, having chosen to go into this field as well um i get i mean <laughs> It, it turns out if you start managing people, then like it's actually the people that starts to become the things that you become the most proud of. So just in the same way as Craig and Connor and DB, I'm very proud that I actually managed to make a team. And then actually even more prouder that I managed to dissolve this team into other teams. Like we managed to build our own culture within the company and then managed to distill that, that culture, like the mobile culture 
in all these other teams by like dissolving it. And so I don't know, it, it just kind of, you know, like how people say when they become a parent, you, you know, you re reprioritize everything and focus around that. Like when you start managing people, you start to like think about programming and about developing in a very different way. And it, it reshifts your priorities. And that explains why all of us that have done managing here and, and have only really talked about the way in which we've had relationships with people and how that's been the thing we're most proud of. Which brings me to the thing that I'm not the most proud of, which is one of those relationships is kind of not feeling great. So like, these are the things that like I sh should be spending my personal time on and improving. Um, and like relationships and people are like the most important part of this kind of project. So taking the time and trying and fixing this like bit by bit is realistically the thing that I'm doing at the moment. So yeah, that's my, that's my <laughs> people. Um, if, uh, since everybody talks about people, uh, I want to add something that I'm proud of, just a random example of something that I'm very proud of that is technology. And um, this is not an artsy, but uh, something that I've carried uh, with me for, for years. Uh, I, on a, on a, I was working for a company maybe 10 years ago, it was a boring enterprise software company, and we had a technical challenge of uh, getting... Uh, hardware information from computers in Java. So we wrote this like some some helper code and we bought some library that was doing it and it was doing it poorly. We started a project and open sourced it. It's called Oshi, uh, open source hardware information or something like that. And uh, for about four years, five years almost, nobody contributed to that project and it was just us doing a little bit of code there, like one, one and a half person, literally. And then I came to work at Artsy and that project kind of went to sleep and nobody cared about it. And then about three years ago, it got picked up by a few people, then a few more people and a few more people. And now it's hundreds of people doing this in, uh, in GitHub slash Oshi. And they are contributing code that collects hardware information from all kinds of things, you know, disks, motherboards, CPUs, and stuff like that. And it's used all over the place. And it's something that I started in five minutes, spent like an hour of my life on, but it took a whole life of its own. And I'm very proud for, for just triggering that something that I needed and putting it out there. And it found a community of its own, and I'm not part of it by any means these days. <laughs> a failure. Um, okay, I, I think this we talk about this a lot. Um, I think Artsy had years to uh, to find itself, find its business, and what we're doing. And uh, in in some early days, we made uh, technical decisions that were very easy to make as a small team. In the way we model data, in the way we built some services, and I think uh, you know I. In hindsight, I would have made very different choices. We're paying a very high price today, having to refactor our way out of the mess that I have created. Uh, so I, I, you know, uh, it's great that I'm still around as, an, as a historian of that code base, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not proud uh, of it uh, in many ways. And I have people who are really struggling uh, making ends meet in that code base. And I effectively like, created the thing and packed it on and... Uh, they suffer now, and I'm not proud of it. Uh, I guess on the less serious failures, I definitely had many uh, Friday night happy hour deploys that I've not been very proud of and have taken the site down in the early days more than I should have. Um, especially, finally remember shipping a, a bug to our first unveiling of uh, Artsy at Art, Art Basel, where Will Ferrell was literally in the audience with a big carpet over monitor about to be pulled off on a big screen, hacking till the wee hours of the night. I'm like, I got this. I had nailed every bug in the tracker. We're like bug free. I'm going to take a nice long nap into two in, two in the afternoon, like 30 minutes before we have to unveil this thing. Sure enough, I was testing on a laptop. This was on a big monitor and this million dollar Warhol piece was stretched out vertically and I had 30 <laughs> minutes to uh, get this thing deployed before it literally was revealed right in front of Will Ferrell's eyes. So, I don't know if I'd say that was like not proud. I actually think that was like a proud failure of mine because I made, <laughs> happened, happened to fix that deploy and uh, convince DV to let me do that in the last minutes. 
But on a, a more serious note, I'd say a failure that I'm less proud of, I think in the earlier days, like more in the middle of the a big growth spurt at Artsy, we were kind of figuring out our organization and we we're hiring very fast. And we had a, like a, a marketing team that wasn't really the team. We we're building up a like marketing group of people and we we're having a lot of tensions between engineering and marketing. And I was uh, kind of in a pinch to figure out how to be able to handle these oncoming amount of marketing engineering work that was coming through the pipeline. And I think uh, made a mistake in sort of not recognizing that we ended up hiring an individual who uh, was kind of working in between these engineering and marketing teams. And in hindsight, I wish I had more better set up this person for, for growth and career development at RC. And I think I, in retrospect, I learned how just how important it is to have a strong technical mentor and leader and not give, put somebody in between and uh, lack of structure. So that's, that's my more serious note, but I'll pass on. Um, I don't know. I, like, I, I guess I'd like to reframe failure. I feel like failure is only, you only really fail when you don't learn from a mistake. Um, but I would say code wise failure or a mistake. I, one time while running a script in production for booth creation, I think I did something wrong and like messed something up. Craig, I think eventually helped me out of it, but yeah. Um, messing something up in production would probably be a failure. So my biggest engineer, engineering fail was when, um, okay, so just some backstory, Artsy has this security program. It's a bounty program where researchers around the world are invited to uh, try and hack Artsy. And if they find some vulnerability, then they can report it and we can uh, pay them a small sum and have their Twitter handle like listed in this long list of um, uh, researchers. So one time when it was maybe like, a, uh, I don't know how long, maybe like a few months into working at Artsy, um, I accidentally um, exposed an, an API key to production and um, some hacker person found it and they were able to retrieve like a bunch of email, pretty much like all of our email addresses and uh, they reported it, but um, instead of taking the small sum, they asked for a very large sum <laughs> and then yeah, I don't want to get too much into the details, but um, I will say, though, that the recovery of that was really, um, I thought, elegant because um, I wasn't blamed for that error. I mean, we have a PR, uh, we have a pull request uh, kind of process where an engineer, you would basically like ask to review uh, some, a piece of code to another engineer and they will say yes or no and uh, hit merge basically and merge it into the code base, goes into production. Um, and so because that process is kind of like a dual person thing, um, I mean, I wasn't as much involved in like the external communication, but like Craig who was handling that kind of external communication handled it really gracefully and, um, you know, he didn't mention my name or anything. He was just saying, like, we as a team did this, blah, blah, blah. This is the result. And I thought that was um, really, uh, yeah, nice of him to do that <laughs> and not fire me. <laughs> so that's a fail. Um, so it's, it's a fun anecdote. We, uh, we ended up having to use all our Russian hacking skills to find who the person was. <laughs> and, and gave him a call uh, directly with our attorney uh, in present. Uh, and that changed the conversation a little bit, but we did end up paying uh, some money. Uh, but um, I think the way we handle retrospectives and problems like this is good. We, we definitely don't have a culture of, of blame or anything like that. And that shows uh, you know, we, we want people to be comfortable uh, pushing code and uh, we try to create process. We think it's all these things are failure of process, not a failure of, uh, uh, of people. And then uh, I have a bigger failure than Kana in terms of monetary value. Um, uh, I insisted that we, uh, because you know, we are superstar developers, that we can add uh, reserve pricing for our charity auctions uh, quickly. And I, I was the one arguing for like 
what's the big deal? Let's add reserve pricing into the system for this auction that's happening in three days and we can totally do it. So, and I volunteered to code it. We're like a smaller team. I wrote a lot of the early software. So I wrote reserve pricing and the auction went well until um, somebody came to congratulate me for uh, reaching the, a really high price for a lot. And I looked at the price and I was like, this is weird. It jumped $12,000 up. Turns out after reserve pricing, uh, the next bid that the system took was the max bid of the person and not an increment. And uh, it jumped up by 12 grand instead of $1,000. It was a charity auction. The person who was uh, bidding was okay to spend $12,000 because we were willing to give that money anyway to the charity. But that was a $12,000 mistake on a like $5,000 lot. So uh, I happily uh, had wrote a fix with a test for it <laughs> that night that was like, oh. What, what was I thinking? This, is, this code is terrible. <laughs> All right. Any, any final words of advice? Yep. Uh, since I have Mike, I'll speak. Uh, my, 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 my advice to all juniors is the same. Uh, you need to have a personal uh, blog for, your, uh, for yourself. In which it should be like a Jekyll blog, maybe a medium blog, but you know, if you don't have one, maybe a Jekyll blog on GitHub. Uh, and um, in which every time you face a problem, uh, a technical issue, or you're working on something, finish it by writing the post. And I've been doing it since, like, I don't know, 94. And uh, I have, I Google myself all the time for technical problems. And whenever I learn something new, I write it down. And that has served me tremendously. And that is a massive differentiator between you and the person next to you when you're interviewing for jobs. And if you can do it consistently over time, and you can show it to yourself that that's the way you work when it becomes part of how you do things, um, you're going to do amazing. So that's my advice is start, start there. Make one tonight and write a blog post about something that you learned in this panel. We actually, uh, we, we call that being de-blocked internally because <laughs> uh, if you're looking in like Ruby world stuff, you find them all the time. Um, so, I mean, I gave you guys like half an hour's worth of random advice. So the TLDR is, oh, everything DB said is correct. Um, and uh, I don't know, uh, the, 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 the biggest thing for me when I was a junior was to have a large corpus of code. So just make things, uh, even if they don't necessarily have to have an end goal with it. And so that the next time you want to make something else, you can reference it and just make lots of small projects and just keep, keep experimenting. Making things is great advice. Yeah, it's kind of piggybacking off the making things. I think it's uh, to kind of take that to a next step, I'd say uh, don't be afraid of contributing to open source code. Don't be afraid of diving, getting your hands dirty, diving into a project that a lot of, I mean, being a, in a programmer is being a perpetual learner and you're going, like DB has mentioned before, you're, what's best practices two years ago is gone in the next two years and old stuff gets resurfaced and there's just always something com completely new knowledge to be learned. So don't be afraid to dive in and learn things that you think are so far away from your immediate knowledge base because it's, it's always going to be that, like that in this career forever. So you might as well roll up your sleeves now and, and start working on something that's interesting and learn along the way because a lot, a lot can be learned just by continuing to kind of hit hurdles and find your way out of it and continuing to find your happy path and get to somewhere where you're actually productive and making something. And as Kana's mentioned, your code you wrote two years ago, in two years is going to look awful and you're going to uh, learn a lot by just kind of looking at what you've done and where you've, become, you've gotten to. I guess that's definitely advice for kind of before getting into a, a job and career, I'd say very much try to build things and continue to learn as you build. And after getting into kind of the job hunt, I definitely uh, recommend keeping an, an eye and ear out for what the company's like and what kind of uh, mentorship they, they have and provide and asking 
the, the right questions and looking for the right red flags and knowing that as a junior, you're going to be supported in an environment where you have a uh, strong mentorship that has a blameless culture and is really uh, takes building juniors seriously and has a good mix of juniors and seniors in their, their team and looks like something that's going to help uh, jumpstart your career and not something that's going to kind of like shove you into the support engineer group and not give you any opportunity or ladder to really grow your, your knowledge base and your, your career. So that, I guess that's my two like before and after job hunt advice. Um, the advice I think I would give is that you are not your code um, and the code that you write is not the sum of who you are. Um, I think sometimes because this is so challenging, like we can get caught up in thinking that like, um, because we're having a challenge with this particular thing that we're like not um, great or that we're not contributing when that's like most often the furthest from the truth and your unique life experience makes you um, inherently valuable. Um, so that, and then also I would say that um, sell it, like be mindful to celebrate like how far you've come. Cause I think as you continue to like move the marker forward and constantly strive to make progress that you kind of forget how much progress you've made and how far you've come. So it's really important to like reflect on like what you've learned thus far. And, and like even your first day at boot camp, what that was like to like now and, and your first interview to like when you finally get your job, like really, really make sure to, to reflect on those things. Cause it, it gives you the push to continue um, going forward and, and not get burned out and, and remembering that you have been successful and will continue to be successful moving forward. Um, I guess my piece of advice would be that you guys especially are all coming from such different backgrounds and you've had a whole life before coding and all of that. And that's like a huge asset. I mean, going into a company and interviewing like you have to mention all of the past experience that you've had and the fact that you can communicate and, you know, recent CS grads, they probably, you know, maybe they won't be as, uh, you know, good in a company setting or maybe they won't be able to communicate their thoughts as clearly. But if you can show that and if you can really like highlight your past experience, I think that's really valuable. Um, and there's another thing. Oh, yeah. The other thing I would say is... Just, it, you probably have heard this a lot, but like trying to stand out in your um, during the interview process and resumes. Well, I don't know. We had this one resume of wild back that and this guy, he like recreated our engineering blog, but then it was he posted on his own site and then he put his resume on top of it. And like all of us were just sharing the crap out of it. And we're like, holy crap, look at this person like doing this really cool resume. And we all ended up reading this person's resume because we just thought it was cool. Um, and so if there is a company that you really want to work for, I mean, don't be hard on yourself if you don't get it, of course. But I think it's really worth at least trying to do something special for that uh, company, whether it be like in the resume or something you build or even just like going out of your way to talk to somebody. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So does anyone in the audience have any questions? Um, I know different companies have different policies uh, about taking work home, but I was wondering how often do you guys do it, if at all? And um, is it because of deadlines, or is it because of just uh, you want to work on your code and advance it uh, personally? Can everyone, did everyone hear that question? Okay. Can you repeat it? Uh, it, it was quite long, so I'll <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I know different companies have different policies regarding taking code home with you. I was wondering if you guys take code home at all, and if you do, uh, was it for personal reasons uh, to advance the code, or was it due to a deadline or something else? Um, I guess it was, there's no policy at Artsy for like taking work home. I mean, if you have a deadline, then you want to try to like hit that deadline. But hopefully, you have like a pro a project manager who is like skilled enough to be able to like create small tasks that you guys can definitely complete in normal work hours. I mean, that would be the most ideal. Um, I mean, there definitely have been times where I would take home some work and, and do that. But um, honestly, it's like, it's just kind of fun for me. So it was, didn't feel like, you know, too terrible. Um, but for sure, I'm definitely guilty of having like not stepping away at times. So I think that's, um, yeah, blessing and a curse. 
Yeah, I would say the times that I've taken work home was just because like it's been like this one problem that was really nagging me and I like like I needed to figure it out. But other than that, I wouldn't say like it's mandatory that you have to, you know, take work home. That's not really our culture. I know. I'm su I'm surprised you're not working 24/7. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kyla. Um, nice to meet you guys. Good to see you again. See um, my question has more to do with your experience before coming in because you talk so much about how being an individual and all the work that you've done before really does influence and impact you as an engineer. And so I was wondering, um, what's something that you guys bring from your past experience that actually makes you uh, feel like you're a better engineer? I guess I'll answer because I'm like, um, well, it's also very artsy appropriate. I've been drawing paintings since I was really young and I have an art degree. And so like, obviously I found artsy <laughs> and it was perfect fit again. Um, and I guess from that past experience being more of a self-starter and creative type, I've always, I always tell people that code and programming is way more of an art and a than it is a science. And in many ways, I think it's actually, personally, I find it's more of a field that might align with say like architecture, uh, design, and in ways it's, I guess it goes back to what I'm saying about how code can often be more of a human problem, more of something that you need to be writing elegant code that people can read and understand more often than you need to write for machines. So I guess from the, my, my art background, I would I find a lot of parallels in that respect. Thanks. Um, I, I I attended a um, like a like a like a hacker school, but for designers uh, before Artsy and um, before the job before that, um, because uh, I felt like design was something that I was really interested in and that it was something that like I could do, um, and so I learned how to do print design, and that actually made me a significantly more useful programmer. They gave me the ability to maybe not be as good enough a designer as someone here, but enough to have an eye for it and to understand the general like feel. So if I needed to finish some design work off for somebody, or try and like gauge what something should look like at a different size, I had all those kind of skills just just there for me. Um, so quick story on my background. I uh, graduated school with a computer science degree, um, but it was completely useless to me. And I ended up in a job uh, that was called customer support engineer. So it had the word engineer in it. And I thought it was awesome, but it was basically like a glorified like uh, help center, um, helping people like implement our API or whatever. Um, but I have like, I have terrible communication skills and I think like learning how to write like an email, like very basic things or, you know, learning how to talk to a client or um, I think especially this one is important is um, kind of like treating your coworkers um, as if they're your clients. So like if we work with like an arts team or with uh, our marketing team kind of like really giving that perspective of, of I'm a person, I'm, I just happen to be an engineer, but um, let me talk to you as a person. I think all of you guys probably have that kind of skill um, as well, coming from different backgrounds, um, and that's super valuable. Hi. Um, you all mentioned several times how you have to be vulnerable and that you have to continually learn to be an engineer, but how do you grow in this career. So things that I've been watching and looking at for like the past five years and how tech changes so regularly, how do you grow? Because I see the, the person that may have come from any corporate landscape and decided that I'm gonna now be a, get a, um, be a startup owner or a, start, a startup founder, or I'm gonna be a product manager and maybe become a, a project manager and I may move up to be a CTO and like that's what I see. I see you grow from being an engineer and you may go to CTO or you leave and you start your own and that's a spectrum that I see from reading but how do you grow when you're continuously learning? Like right now we're, 
we just finished, well, we're finishing up Java and we start Android in our cohort. Um, we're, we do two cohorts right here. So for Android specific, we start Android on Saturday. And some of us have these backgrounds with other coding languages and you talk about Ruby and then Volker mentioned, you know, that we don't see any Android stuff, but maybe we might help change that. So you're continuously growing, you're continuously learning new languages, getting softer skills, treating your, your peers on another team as clients and stuff, but how, what do you do? What's the trajectory? It's a good, it's a good question. Uh, I've grown uh, uh, in, in many ways uh, in this environment where technology changes a lot. So my experience, there are, uh, there are really two career paths in engineering. One is very technical and one is very managerial. That's traditional career paths, right? So you become an engineer, then you become a more experienced engineer, and then eventually somebody comes to you and say, says, like, do you want to be a, a stronger engineer or do you want to be a people manager? That happens often. But an, another way of looking at it is, uh, do you, if, if you were to choose between people and technology, where, what would you rather choose? I chose people and other people may have chosen technology. Like I think Orta is a great example for that. Uh, and so it's not really that we, have, we can't do each other's job necessarily, but we prioritize certain things. Now, there are other things that you learn anyway, and I still learn more programming languages. I've picked up Ruby for the first time six years ago. Uh, I've done Scala for the first time at Artsy and, uh, and you know, Elixir. So TypeScript, I yet have to do a single line of TypeScript uh, in, at Artsy. I have like pros of TypeScript. Around. So the, these things, technology, languages, and uh, maybe new processes, this is lifelong learning. Uh, but uh, whether you are on the management track, larger and larger teams and working with more people, it's one track. And the other track is just how big is the problem that you are trying to solve and how impactful are you in the size of the problem? How can you take small systems, larger systems, very large systems and, uh, and be really effective in those? So I think these are like orthogonal things. I hope this answers your question. Hello, I'm also asking a question related to technology changing so fast. So you mentioned in your presentation that your team worked on developing the technology behind um, similar search, and then you decided to go with something that was already out there. So how does a company deal with that? Like, um, the, where does that code base go? And what have those people who worked on it, the engineers, what happened to them? How did they deal with What that? happens to engineers <laughs> when their code gets deleted? <laughs> I, I think code gets, that gets deleted is the best kind of code because you don't have to maintain it. I think code is a liability, not an asset. And uh, I'm very, very serious about that. It's uh, the less code you have, the better it is. So it's the best day of any engineer's life when their code gets replaced by somebody else's code or a system that is so much better than what they could ever have come up with. It served its, its time. It's time to retire. That's a good thing. We don't retire enough code by any means. What happens to those engineers? Well, hopefully they've moved on from that code base a long time ago and are doing something much more exciting now or, or can go do something much more exciting than to maintain their crappy code that they wrote three years ago. And they look back at it and like, oh my God, did I really write that? So with sk skills evolved too. So that code that was written a long time ago is probably very, very bad anyway. Yeah, it's, it's always, it's an opportunity that we don't, Certainly, engineers don't get uh, trashed with their, the code that we trash. It's an opportunity to, <laughs> to celebrate the fact that we don't have to maintain this anymore and that that person can move on to bigger and better things. Um, definitely agree with DB that we like killing code. <laughs> yeah, this is actually important, I think, for learning. Uh, I can give an example of at least one engineer that was so good at debugging Windows processes and was like the best kernel debugger that I've ever met. And it became his specialty and he never relearned to do anything else. And at some point the company uh, the, where I was, I was working at Microsoft, the group decided that we're no longer writing C++ code and now it's .NET world. And the kernel debugger lost his job because that's all he could do. And he never, he, he, the, the sign was on the wall, but uh, technology evolved and he never evolved with technology. 
and he had about a whole year to relearn as everybody else was and just decided that he is irreplaceable. So, you know, you are always replaceable in a code base and the code will be gone before you know it. I didn't think that also goes back to the, the part of you aren't your code. So like this attachment to it, there really shouldn't be it because it's, again, it's an opportunity. So I'm very much from the background of work hard, play hard, and this might not be so technical based, but I'd like if all of you could just answer either in one word or one sentence, what do you do to de-stress? <laughs> no, Orta, 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 no, can you, can you. <laughs> we need them to retain. Thanks, Orta. Uh, uh, I go figure drawing. Uh, I have, if you want to follow my art Instagram, it's artdblog.org. Yeah. I've <laughs> yeah, I, I, drawing from life as well, um, exercise. I, I love programming and coding, so sometimes I'll just switch gears and work on a side project that is interesting, fun, new tech that's not work-related stuff. I think one thing that's kind of cool about working at RTV, we all pretty much like to kind of have that, follow that philosophy of work hard, play hard. Um, so there's happy hour on Fridays. That's, that's a good one. Um, and then also I would say for me personally, I, I'm a pretty big hobbyist, so I like to pick up a new hobby. So right now it's DJing. So oh, kind of cool. do it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's dope. <laughs> it's dope. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What did you last do for DJing? Ah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. So we had, <laughs> we had a, um, artsy party um, maybe about two or three weeks ago. It was at the public hotel in the Lower East Side. And that was my very first DJ gig. And it was so fun. It was like really cool to play songs and see like people and my coworkers really vibe to it. It was fun. I'm still working on a DJ name. Maybe you can help me out, you guys. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, so, you know, X Dina star is my, my handle. So DJ X Dina star or, um, DJ Black Alchemy. I like that one. I like that one. And then also somebody, so yeah, somebody um, recently termed um, DJ Gold Shoes because I wear these shoes, you know. But um, so I'm, I'm taking um, um, suggestions. So. Um, my hobbies are really boring. I I like to cook. And I like to read. <laughs> um, and I like to watch Netflix. <laughs> OK, my name is Ivan Mendoza. And I have a question for you two guys, since you come from a bootcamp background. How do you overcome the imposter syndrome? Well, oh man, I still have it. Like every single one one on one I have with Craig, I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't think I'm like, I don't think I'm right for this role or like, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how to do this really basic thing. Um, I think you're going to just pretty much have it for the rest of your life. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, maybe Orta and DV and Craig could speak more later in the career, but for sure I still have it now. And I think that helps you to learn, like, let's say what you were saying about uh, expanding you know, learning new languages or kind of keeping up to date with technology that really helps uh, when you are comfortable with going into something where you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and then just kind of being okay, like sitting in that discomfort, you'll just get used to it and it'll be okay. Um, I think it's one, it's important to kind of recognize that usually people that have like um, imposter syndrome or tend to be high achievers. So the fact that you have imposter syndrome is kind of because you like you expect a lot of yourself. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, and then as far as like how to cope with that um, imposter syndrome, I found that having like a good support system has really helped me. So being here at RT in this culture has really contributed to a lot of my personal and professional growth. And then also having someone um, kind of similar to you that can kind of validate your experience. And so I often talk to Khan and we can be like, okay, yeah, I'm not the only one. And it's, it's normal. It's normal to like struggle with things that are challenging, so. Um, 
not me, but there's another engineer at Artsy that is not from a boot camp who also definitely has imposter syndrome. And he is like known as one of the greatest engineers in like the iOS ecosystem. Um, you don't, you know, you don't have to be from a boot camp to have imposter syndrome. It's very legit that a lot of people just don't feel entirely comfortable in where their position is. But chances are, if the people around you think that you're good for that position, then you're good for that position. He wrote books on this stuff, so <laughs> it's, it's always incredible. I think it is just something you have, and you always wonder whether you are good enough for anything that you do. Uh, as, a, as more experienced uh, leaders, we, we try to learn and to teach, to tell people who are good at what they do that they're really good at what they do. And I think Khan is great at what she does at her job. I don't mean good, I think she's great at this. And uh, I hope that every time she has this, uh, she hears from all of us that she's great at the job. <laughs> so You're all great too, but I want to. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hey, 10,000% echo that. We can move on to the next question now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Tyshawn, and I heard a lot of you guys actually talking about side projects. And I was just wondering if any of you had side projects right now that you thought were really interesting. No, you keep it. I guess, yeah, I, I guess I can kick that off. Um, I always have some random side projects. I have a whole backlist of them. I guess the most most recently, most like purely technical side project that I've been hacking on is there's this language called Elixir, which is a compiled to Erlang, looks like Ruby, reads really nice, but also has some really badass <laughs> performance implications under it. Um, so I've been working on a, a full stack framework that's sort of a, <laughs> this is all the hipster stuff in one, one sentence here, GraphQL <laughs> meets uh, Elixir scripts to JavaScript compiler, like uh, bespoke dev experience. Anyways, it's codenamed Griffin, which is the antithesis to the Phoenix framework, which is the main framework there. And then on the other, on the other hand, a side project that I've seen to unearth too often is uh, just rented an apartment recently and uh, went through the chaos of that. So I built a app, little web app called Nofi Digs that scrapes all of the Nofi listings across the web, aggre aggregates it into one search engine and lets you filter down to exactly what apartment you want to find and skip all the broker madness. So that's been useful. Uh, Nofidigs.com. But it's the scrapers aren't maintained anymore. So there's <laughs> it's not very useful right now. <laughs> the, the second one is an opportunity for anyone here. And the, and the first one is a good example of why nothing works on the internet. <laughs> so I tend to have a lot of side projects that I also end up turning into like artsy projects. So it's like I, I, I find a problem that I have with part of like my day-to-day -day tooling or our general process and I start working on that in my spare time. And uh, it gets big enough that it's like it, it takes into my work life uh, balance so strongly that I have to start working on work time. Plus, we use it at work usually. So, like one of those is a dependency manager. Like, at this point, your Java people will probably know Maven. Have you used Maven? Do you use Maven? Yeah. Uh, you'll find out. Uh, you'll definitely find out with Gradle. You have to do Android with Gradle, I think. Um, and then, like, there's Danger, which is another one that. Uh, I, that I care about deeply. I've been caring a lot about a test runner as well. It's just these interesting side projects that are so only work related because I just don't have anything else other than that. <laughs> I, the last year I had, this year I had a uh, non-work related project. We used to have a ping pong table that got folded because of, uh, of, uh, of, of, I don't know what, because of what space. And, uh, and then uh, I, we used the Slack bot, a ping pong bot that was a leaderboard for this. Uh, I ended up fixing up the JavaScript open source Slack bot to work. Uh, and then I ended up extracting, uh, getting really frustrated with the code base and writing it in Ruby. Then I extracted a bot library out of it. And out of the bot library, I extracted a Ruby client. Then I worked endlessly on that Ruby client. And now there's a whole org called Slack Ruby on GitHub. It's Slack Ruby clients, Slack Ruby bots, Slack Ruby, you name it, uh, that all came out of this. And that was like a hobby 
developer thing. Hi, my name is Susana. You guys are amazing. I think you already know that. And my question is, your code is mostly very structured and has particular purpose in supporting how the company grows and works. What are some opportunities for innovation that you see for Artsy? I think of the things that we, um, of the things that we don't spend enough time in that are really like f further looking, blockchain is one. We don't do any enough in that space. AR, VR, I think is very interesting. Um, I, you know, any one of you could contribute to our mobile app and AR, VR experience if you wanted to, if you had enough, uh, you know, got time. It's probably a complicated side project, but probably really ambitious. But that's something we never find time to do in our uh, regular business priorities because well, most of the business priorities are kind of like boring stuff, like selling art and things like that and making user experience better in that space. So uh, the company is still not profitable and has way to go on that in there before we can really spend money on moonshots or research and things like that. Yeah, I very much echo the so many cool ideas that we haven't yet gotten into about bringing the art experience more personally into the digital space with technologies like AR, VR, and just various mediums. Like we still very much support mainly your paintings and sculptures and there's I'm a computer art major, so I'm very much interested in rich media work that is interactive or video based. Uh, and even, you know, extending that into AR and VR technologies, you could see Artsy really becoming a revolutionary platform for that kind of medium. Uh, on the technology space, um, we've been, uh, in the last two years, uh, the iOS team, for example, moved to React Native and the web team has almost consistently now moved to React. And um, kind of what we've been doing is looking at ways of like effectively having the same engineering team, but being able to have a bigger impact with our day-to-day -day code. So could, some of that is looking at ways in which we can share between web, iOS, and eventually Android. We literally have a PR with Android support to some of our React Native code. Um, and so we're looking at ways in which we can just reuse the things that we're already doing in multiple platforms. And so technology-wise, it's really interesting to, to be breaching these new like areas that you've never really heard of actually sharing code between iOS and web other than just a, a simple website inside an, inside an app. And like those are the current problems that we're literally talking about on a day-to-day -day basis at the moment. So I think that's pretty cool. Hey guys, um, my name is Mel. Um, thank you for having us. It's pretty cool. Um, but I have a question that focuses more on branding versus like uh, being engineers. Uh, in a day and age where branding is really important, how did you guys come up with the name Artsy for such a like conservative, uh, sophisticated uh, kind of placement where art is? Uh, and secondly, would you guys say that um, as a as an engineer going into like job roles, would you guys focus on you know, being that conservative engineer or kind of spicing things up and adding your own flavor and showing them who you truly are? So are two very good and very different questions. <laughs> I'll answer the first one because I'm probably the engineer has the most context from the early days of that. Basically, it was the only available five character name that started with A that like art was in the, in the name and it was short and we had a .sy Syrian domain server way back in the day and so it was like it was available and affordable for the and it had art in it and so it was really like not a very complex process carter was just like the prior name to this was uh exabytes which yeah th thankfully we're n we're not that anymore so basically like i think we hired a designer at the time when i joined uh, his name was c ming he's he was great and he was like Carter, we can't have this name. We need a new name. So they just like looked up the most convenient short short name. That's it's basically the deciding process there. Check out the logo in the front of that. You can still see that it's got little toe pegs in the case of Yeah, we had a branding agency 
emphasize that a dot. So there's still that that relic of that until the servers went down, and then everyone on New Year's Day had to, long story, mm -hmm. get it back up, and now we're RC.net. But anyways, that was the choice behind the name is basically convenience of the domain name. Um, wish there was something better to that. But to the second question, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, is basically picking between a more conservative uh, engineering trajectory or really being able to show, sorry, can you, can we, can you repeat that question again, the second one? Yeah, I, I mean, I think showing definitely, personally, I wouldn't, would want to only work in an organization that would, uh, would like to see that and would have emphasis on those inequalities, especially artsy. That's a very uh, compelling uh, attribute we look for in candidates. So to that effect, if like you were looking for organizations that have great work environments and in positive culture like RC does, it's definitely a help on your, your application process. And generally I would say, emphasize that is something that should be highlighted. And probably some of your best work is behind the, the work, your passion projects and showing your, your true self. So I absolutely think that that should be the case. I mean, maybe cer certain organizations would want to want you to emphasize bullet lists of I have XML experience and this and that experience, but some of the more rewarding uh, organizations that you can work for are going to be looking at those kind of unique, uh, those unique experiences, those unique projects. So I think it's, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, so artsy engineering has actually spent some time branding itself in, uh, in some playful ways. We used to have a lot of Easter eggs on the site. Uh, you can see, still see some relics of it if you go to artsy.net slash humans.txt. There's an Easter egg hunt. I think we are down from the seven Easter eggs that we had. We should update that one. That could be a PR too. Uh, once you found all the Easter eggs, you can update the humans.txt file with the actual number of Easter eggs we have left. Uh, but we, you know, for a while, you could like um, you could do the Konami code on the iOS app and turn it into ASCII, the whole thing. Uh, and so that's that's a little bit of our global corporate identity in there. Uh, Do, oh, the Doge mode was great. Uh, yeah, it, what's the Easter egg for Skrillex? Yeah, if you go to any artwork on Artsy and add and 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 type. Yeah. <laughs> To, to, add, to add to that question, I would say it's important to identify what you want, right? So if you are looking for a culture where you can bring your full self, then bring your full self to the interview. If you're looking for a culture where it's going to be rigid, yeah, maybe a, another 20K might be on the table, but I mean, you have to leave and shut off parts of yourself. So if you can identify what you value and what you want, that will determine how maybe you should approach your interview. I think there's, there's also like, you know, we're, we're here because we want to be expressing ourselves in that sense. And, but there is a lot of value in working at larger corporate like entities. You get a much more structured learning setup. You get a lot more resources and you get like a, a team that will like have more time to be able to devote to teaching you. And, um, and those are all trade-offs uh, that you'll have to make. Like at least like us three guys here, we all joined at a very early stage where, the, the, none of the infrastructure is in place to have any of that. But like, if you go work at a larger corporate uh, venue, then you will have to trade off a little bit of the personal personality you want to put out there for like infrastructure, and that's a good trade off sometimes. Yeah, I worked at Microsoft for five years, and I th I think that was an amazing job. And uh, it's a very rigid, very large corporation where you are, if anything, a number. People used to refer to each other by their employee number, literally. You're like, oh, you're employee 100,072? Uh, I was like, yeah, that's me. Uh, so, uh, 
So, but, but I learned everything about serious engineering there. Hello, my name is James. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for um, giving me the um, inspiration because I come from the art background myself. So to have two people that are on the panel that also just understand uh, what it feels like to be so nervous to, to jump into a field that has um, so much to do with, with so little that you've actually dedicated uh, yourself to. Um, that leads me to my question. So at the place that we're all at now, um, with decreasing learning curves, uh, what I've uh, seen from uh, Arta is that uh, he likes to take on uh, projects. Um, it, it helps him to, to understand. Um, as far as DB, uh, I saw that um, self-referencing with the, the blog posts. Um, for the rest of the panel, um, because myself, I, I just take meticulous notes on everything. <laughs> what, do you have little um, life hacks as far as how you decrease your uh, learning curves? Because to speak to the whole idea of uh, being the perpetual learner, like we spoke about, which we, we've heard so much tonight, and then also um, being vulnerable and allowing yourself to take in the information. Um, what for you, just like the, the other two, helps you to um, allow that information to come into you at a, at a faster rate. <laughs> yes, it's uh, Orta's impending pressure to always keep up to his standards now. Um, I need to think on that a bit more, yeah. Um, I guess like little hacks that I do. Um, I write, I, when I first started, I used to write everything, every little task I needed to do on a post-it note and just like stuck it all around my computer. And then it was also, but I found that that was really intimidating because then there's just all these tasks that are just in front of you. So I started just putting everything into like a notebook. So like every week I'll just write down all the things that I want to do or want to get done and then just turn the page the next week. And then if there's anything else from the other, the week before, then just transfer it to the next page. But uh, just, you know, go one week at a time kind of thing. Um, and then I also have like an Evernote, um, the Evernote app just for note taking. And I'll just, every time that there's like a, you know, sm small like Mongo query that I need to remember or some kind of small bit of code or small idea, I would just put that in a note and just reference, just try to be organized there. But um, you can find your own way of organizing notes. I think putting that in like a public setting would be a better idea, but uh, that's something that I still need to work on. <laughs> so there I think for me there are two things I generally try in some cases to lean into the things that I'm not so comfortable with um, and I'm also guilty of like punking out sometimes so like I li like what I've done I think this past year is like share some of the things that I want to do with Orta if you want anybody that's going to keep you accountable to something Orta is your man like if you if you like if, it's, if you don't want it to be a thing don't don't tell Orta <laughs> So I think there's that. Um, and yeah, maybe lean into the things that you aren't comfortable. And also, um, I have a really great lead um, right now. And so in my last review cycle, we identified like some actual like measurable things that like identified as success. So technical growth was one of my areas of focus. And so giving a talk, a lunch and learn at Artsy on um, type, TypeScript, which is something like I was like, no TypeScript. So things like that. Um, another one was saying um, no to a stakeholder that was had an ask for like maybe a feature request or a bug fix and like encouraging them to like write an issue and, and go through our process. That was generally uncomfortable for me. I'd be like the one that would do all the things for the people sliding in the in the dm and asking for like you know can you just fix this thing so like those things like actionable measurable goals i think has has really been helpful oh yeah another thing so i um i think used to be really apprehensive of asking questions in the open like on our slack channel like that used to really intimidate me it sometimes still does um but i would like defer to asking my lead just general questions and technical questions and he used he would you know answer my questions but then encourage me to share them with a group and explain that it was actually more helpful for me and the group at large to share those questions and that questions were okay so like 
in, in sharing those questions, one, I'd got more people to help answer the questions. And then also because there is a record in Slack, anybody who else might have that same question could refer to the question that I asked. So then it, it kind of like demystifies and makes asking questions not so scary. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely uh, a very important part of, of learning and being able to find an environment where it definitely feels comfortable to be able to ask questions amongst people and no questions are, are wrong or dumb or being able to saying yes to a lot of things is something that I think I will maybe immediately be shy away from uh, doing a conference talk or uh, conducting some certain like facilitating certain meetings or discussions or whatnot and I think I my instinct might be like to be less of that extrovert but I remind myself that you always learn by putting yourself in challenging situations. So defaulting to saying yes and, and kind of figuring it out from there, even when that comes to code, it's, you know, if there's a project that, you're, that I might be intimidated by, uh, I'm like, let's go ahead and fork this and make the first reach out the first pull request to start a discussion and try to kind of dive into that deep end and rip off that, the first initial ice breaking bandaid and, really try to just open up that discussion and kind of break that that first barrier and get past the anxiety of maybe this is this code is going to look bad but if you put it out sooner you get through that sooner and you learn faster um yeah and a lot i echo a lot what con and christina said too a lot of hack um i i i do the hardest and the most challenging thing first in the day so I commit to it, try to commit to it the day before, and then I wake up and this is the first thing I do. And it can be, it can be solving a problem. It can be uh, in my job talking to people about difficult things. It can be anything, but it's the thing that I've been putting away for a long time. I'm going to commit to doing it first thing in the morning, and that helps me a lot getting through, through it. Well, you get one more from me. Um, I, I, mine is probably the, uh, your inbox can be a stream, um, like to maybe not obsess over getting inbox zero and to just like actually sometimes let things fade away. If, if it's important, it'll probably come back up again. Um, I, I maintain literally hundreds of, of smallish open source projects and regularly just let things drop in the hope that either someone else will pick it up if they care or, um, or I just don't care, and that's also fine. Um, and so sometimes, just there's lots. If there's lots and lots of small things, just saying I, it's not a priority, or maybe not even saying anything, and just expecting somebody to just assume that it's not a priority for you. Yeah, I like that. And to add to this, you choose what fails, and the most important thing can't fail, but the less important thing can't fail. It's okay. Don't do it because it's easy. Let let it fail. Sometimes it's okay. Um, uh, hi, thank you for taking my question. You pre uh, DB, you previously mentioned that um, when you hire new hires that you evaluate them through references mostly. But uh, for us, uh, how would you evaluate, best evaluate um, in artsy um, fresh graduates? Yeah, we, we do references on you before you graduated. So whatever it is that you did uh, in your past life, uh, is your reference. <laughs> so I think, I think f references is not a checkbox anymore from in most companies. And I encourage you to find the people who are your best advocates, the closest to the job. So of course, if you've been programming before, it should be, ideally it should be your previous manager or their manager or somebody like that, but actually would be your best foot forward. The people, the people who, um, uh, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example of a, of a reference that I had to do for myself. Like I, I did a little, I wanted for a long time, a while ago, to do due diligence on projects because I've been advising startups and so on. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. I get to dig a little bit into their technical stuff. And they're like, have you done it before? Like, no, but uh, like, why would I? hire you. And so I had to come up with references who could speak really highly about myself, about my ability to do this. So I found startups that I was advising and suggested that those be 
uh, the references. So similarly, like I did not do the job before. I literally have no idea if I'm even qualified to do the job. But uh, I will find a reference that will speak to, which I will find somebody who's convinced that I can do the job, and that's my reference. <laughs> Um, I was sort of going to add to the a little nuance also to kind of our our hiring process and when we when we look at more junior candidates, what we're what we use to look at and as DB said, like references are one of our process. And when looking at references, we don't just look at specifically do they have do these references uh, align with the experience of the, in this field in engineering. We're also looking for when these references speak to the, this person's experience, do they, are they the difference between a great and like an excellent reference? Because all references are going to be positive, but the true references that stand out are uh, references that are able to speak to somebody's working with this person. They, you can just tell that they have a different level when they, they talk about this person. This person like went above and beyond in these and those ways. And when somebody's more junior in their career, Another way to that's helpful in our hiring process, we'd look at the trajectory of this person, not just do they check off these boxes, but have they gone out of their way to make a game on our API and have they uh, sh gone from changed backgrounds from a career in a different field, field and within so many months they've thrown themselves into all these situation learning experiences that are putting them on a really uh, accelerated track and a trajectory. So I think it speaks a lot when somebody's earlier in their career to again have projects that show that passion and show that this is something that they're really building up fast to. Thank you guys. So how was your first site visit guys? <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having us. Um, I'm sure they'll stick around for a little while if you guys have any questions, but otherwise you guys are done for the day. You guys are hilarious. Thank you. Can I get cards? Can I get cards? Uh, I can grab. Thank you.